Hey everyone, so we've been running some analysis videos of PlayStation 4 Pro games recently based on pristine 4K assets that Sony provided to us after the event. And it's been instructional to say the least. What we're looking at here are late gen first party games using technology devised by some of the most talented developers in the business on what will quite possibly be the last projects they'll be producing for the PlayStation 4 generation. So what can we learn from how 4K output is rendered? And based on the power profile of the PS4 Pro, what should we be reasonably expecting from the new wave of consoles? So yeah, I expect quite a lot of this video to be about expectation management quite important, I think. You see, when the PS4 Pro came out, Sony made the pitch about smart GPU utilization, as opposed to blowing all of that power on pixel count alone. And thus began in earnest, the age of reconstruction, checkerboarding, temporal supersampling, in combination with more established techniques like dynamic resolution scaling. And then came the more powerful Xbox One X, claims of true 4K, and sure, there are a bunch of 4K games there, but at the same time, we also see very similar use of the techniques used in PlayStation 4 Pro titles. But Sony, Sony First Party, these are the developers that have really invested heavily in these techniques. So what do we see in these brand new games? Well, let's kick off with a look at The Last of Us Part 2 then. Naughty Dog seems to be using an evolved version of the engine used in Uncharted 4, which would make sense. The exact same thing happened with the original game on last gen. Interestingly, the Pro implementation here also has much in common with Nathan Drake's last hurrah in Uncharted 4. We see 1440p resolution with temporal anti-aliasing doing an incredible job of giving a stable image. Pretty much devoid of aliasing in any form, be it specular surfaces or the dreaded jaggies. Looking close up at the new game, there's a strong emphasis on a filmic look, less reliant on raw resolution. But with that said, there's still the sense that Naughty Dog would have pushed further if they could, and whether that's down to memory constraints or other challenges of the Pro hardware remains to be seen. Insomniac Spider-Man again seems to be using a very similar technique to Ratchet and Clank from the same firm, where a 1440p image is injected into a 4K frame buffer with accumulated information from prior frames increasing fidelity. It's not 4K, but it's definitely a good scaling upwards from the results of the base model at 1080p. And as for how this would compare to native 4K, this is a first party game, so we can't really say it. However, Ubisoft seems to use a similar technique in For Honor, and boy, stacked up against the PC version running natively, the resemblance between Pro and the native presentation is uncanny. Now, a quick shout out here to Days Gone, which is still in development. 2160p checkerboard still in place here from when I first saw the game, and while no details have been revealed so far, about the exact specifics of the implementation, what I can say is that at the PS4 Pro tech briefing with Mark Cerny, I saw this game running side by side on 65 inch Sony ZD9 displays, one running with checkerboarding, the other running natively. Aside from a slight reduction in sharpness, unlikely to be discernible at living room viewing distances, well, it looked great. Ghost of Tsushima. Yeah, we pixel count 1800p here, and there are some of the same sawtooth artifacts we saw in Sucker Punch's prior infamous titles. Again though, there's a strong emphasis on anti-aliasing, cutting out shimmer and pixel pop from surfaces and edge jaggies. It's looking good and I can't wait to see more on this one. Death Stranding, it's also a 2160p checkerboard implementation and we know exactly how it's achieved thanks to a joint presentation between Kojima Productions and Guerrilla Games. Now I'll keep this one short, but I'll link to the full thing in the video description below. But the bottom line here is that the native resolution is half Ultra HD, 1920 by 2160. But there are four samples per native pixel derived from two frames. This looks pretty good for straight horizontal or vertical edges, but doesn't really look so good on diagonals. Gorilla's solution? Well, kind of cunning this, the native frame buffer is rotated into what the team calls a tangram, which is blended with a reprojected tangram from a prior frame and output to 2160p. It's a process that from start to finish 
adds just two milliseconds of render time in a 33 millisecond render budget. So essentially the takeaway here is that while there may be refinement in these techniques over the last couple of years, this latest and perhaps last clutch of Sony first party games seem to have stuck to established ways of addressing a 4K TV. The effectiveness varies, but in all cases, the boost over the standard 1080p presentation is palpable. So what has this got to do with the consoles to come then? Well, whether it's PS5 or Xbox 2, the bottom line is that whether it's enhanced current gen consoles or beefed up next gen consoles, 4K represents a hell of a lot of pixels. In terms of a gen on gen leap, the four times multiplier we're seeing here hasn't really been seen since the leap from PlayStation 1 to PlayStation 2. And this was an era where massive jumps in graphics power were more possible than they are now. So allow me to illustrate. PS1, games typically rendered at 240p. And with the leap to PlayStation 2, we saw titles typically running at 448p, though they could run at 640 by 448 or 512 by 448 or even field rendered, which essentially halves bandwidth. But by and large, that is something approaching a four times jump. PlayStation 2 to PlayStation 3, 448p takes a jump to 720p. This time it's just a three times leap in pixel density. And moving forward to PS4, the requirement of the GPU to paint more pixels now drops to a 2.25 times increase. And this is kind of important because the more GPU time you're spending on pure pixel output, the less power you can spend on actually improving visuals. So I've talked in the past about how the pace of technological advancement in the GPU space is slowing down. I've also outlined how a generational leap in GPU throughput, at a basic compute level at least, is kind of doable from the base PS4, but probably not the Pro. Let's return to our chart and see the kind of leap we need to move from 1080p to 4K. The 2.25 times increase from PS3 to PS4 is now a vast four times increase. Now a GPU with twice or three times the fill rate of PS4 Pro is possible, but the basic math suggests that what we'll end up with then will be games with higher resolutions, but looking much the same kind of like a PC graphics card upgrade. In short, an iterative increase that may not actually present that much more of an improvement, certainly not a generational leap. And then consider what next gen almost certainly will deliver, a far superior CPU allowing for, as Microsoft's Phil Spencer has alluded to, higher frame rates and more of an emphasis on titles running at 60 frames per second. Well, again, even if we stick with checkerboarding and other smart upscaling techniques, a lot of the GPU boost over Pro will be spent on delivering that higher frame rate. When next-gen consoles arrive, I do expect to see a cross-gen transition period. And yeah, utilizing Ryzen to deliver 60 frames per second with some additional bells and whistles makes a lot of sense. But fundamentally, we are looking at the same games and techniques like checkerboarding, temporal supersampling and dynamic resolution scaling may well be in effect. In terms of the quality that can be delivered there, Guerrilla Games' presentation is instructional. So here's a shot of Horizon Zero Dawn as it looks on PlayStation 4, the base model. The game uses a combination of FXAA and TAA to achieve this look at 1080p. And this is the reference shot Guerrilla uses as the quality standard. It's native 2160p, but with, get this, 16 times super sampling. Next up, the team calculated how high it could run Horizon on PS4 Pro at native resolution rendering, and it comes to 1512p, pretty close to where a lot of Pro titles actually ship. Clearly, it's an intermediate point between the other two images, but perhaps with more in common with the 1080p image. Now, here's the same comparison with the 2160p checkerboard solution. All of the detail from the reference shot is retained, but, and this is a pretty subtle distinction, you lose some sharpness. The bottom line though is that the effectiveness of the technique is undeniable. And if you can achieve this much and effectively halve your frame render time into the bargain, it simply makes sense to use techniques like this if it opens the door to, at the very least, making 60 frames per second possible on a new console or really using the extra GPU power to make strides in producing an actual generational leap in visual fidelity. 
The second point I want to raise is that these smart upscaling techniques are all implemented in different ways. Sony has a reference checkerboarding solution, but developers tend to customize and build their own solutions. So, example here, Mass Effect Andromeda on Frostbite has a checkerboarding solution derived from Sony's reference version and with a customized use of PS4 Pro's hardware ID buffer in amongst other optimizations. But it's very, very different from the implementation in Death Stranding, which doesn't use the Pro's checkerboarding hardware at all. Now these are both good checkerboarding solutions, but of course there are some bad ones out there too. And it's all down to implementation. It can vary on a developer by developer basis. And there's a ton of games out there that simply don't use any smart upscaling solutions at all. Explaining why so many pro titles are locked to 1440p or using dynamic resolution scaling in that kind of area. I'd say that the results seen in the Sony first party titles are pretty conclusive in providing a great 4K image, even if it's not strictly speaking native 4K. But there is a challenge here for next gen in taking the kind of quality seen from say the Decima engine and ensuring that all developers have access to that level of fidelity. I mean, I've talked about great smart upscaling solutions in this video, but yeah, as I said, there have been some pretty bad ones too, after all. And maybe that will result in PlayStation 5 essentially evolving things hardware side. After all, the checkerboarding in Pro was essentially built from rendering concepts pioneered in the multiplayer section of Killzone Shadowfall, where a 960 by 1080 native image was reprojected horizontally for the full full HD output. Maybe Pro was one part of the evolution and the next will take on lessons learned from the enhanced consoles, Pro in particular. And yeah, there have been these recent reports that AMD's Navi GPU is actually a collaboration with Sony, rumors that I personally haven't been able to corroborate, but the idea of Sony getting more hands-on in GPU design for next gen makes a whole lot of sense based on what we saw in Pro. Now, I'm sure that Mark Cerny and his team of engineers will be looking at Pro as a success as a hardware design that in the right hands at least allowed for visual fidelity that exceeded expectations from a 4.2 teraflop GPU. Maybe it is laying the template for consoles to come in providing custom hardware that can have some truly beneficial results in a power efficient way at the cost of little silicon. Okay, so that's all from me for now, and I hope you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed putting it together. As always, do like and subscribe to support what we do. Ring the bell if subbed for instant notifications. And yeah, if you want to see those PS4 Pro trailers at source quality, consider supporting the DF Patreon to help the team and to see our work in the best way possible. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching.